In this video, I'm going to be covering six amazing CSS Flexbox concepts. And even if you already think you're a master of Flexbox, I guarantee at least half of these you've never heard of or used before. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. And today I'm gonna to be covering six Flexbox concepts. Now to get started, I have very basic HTML. I just have five boxes inside this Flex class right here. And in our CSS, we are just adding display flex to our flex class. And our box has a lot of properties, but they're all just for styling. So all of this content right here is just so that we can have a large number in the center of our box. This is for our background color and our border. And then we're making them grow to full width and give them a height because without that, obviously these boxes are super cramped. So this just makes them have a little bit more space. Now, the very first concept I want to talk about is one that you're probably already familiar with. It's the most common of the techniques on this video, and that is the gap property in Flexbox. So if we just go to our Flex container here and we just add a gap of like 2 REM, that's going to add a space of 2 REM between every one of our elements. Now, this is a property that's a lot newer than Flexbox. It didn't come out with original Flexbox, which is why a lot of people have never heard of it. But as it's become more modern and supported in pretty much every browser, it's a feature a lot of people are picking up on and it's super handy to use because it makes spacing out things so much easier and you don't have to resort to grid to do it since it's natively built into Flexbox. Now, another really amazing thing about Flexbox with Gap is that it actually works when your content wraps as well. If we just come in here and we say that we wanna do a flex wrap of wrap, and we make our content quite big. So instead of doing a flex grow, we just say a width of like 500 pixels. Now when we save, let's actually make it a little bit smaller, we'll do 300. Now when we save, you'll notice that between all of our elements, there's a two REM gap in the horizontal and the vertical direction. So no matter what happens, if we're wrapping or not wrapping, we're always going to have a two REM gap between every single element on our page. And that's just a really nice thing to have. And again, it's one line of code, super easy, and you don't have to worry about any other complexities. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about is how Flexbox works when you change around your document flow or your writing direction for your page. So you're probably already familiar with the concept where you can say flex direction, and I could change it to column, and that's going to stack things vertically like this, or I could leave it as the default of row, and it's going to stack them horizontally. I could also reverse things like this, and same thing for column, I could do the reversed version as well. Well, that's one way of reordering how your flex layout is going to be, but depending on your writing mode, that's also going to change what direction your flow is. So by default, it's row based. But if I change my writing mode here of my document to be, for example, vertical instead of horizontal, you'll now see everything stacks from top to bottom. And you can see even my text is turned sideways. And that's because I'm in a vertical writing mode as opposed to a horizontal writing mode. If I switch back to the horizontal writing mode here, which is the default, you can see everything goes left to right. Well, in the vertical mode, it's going from top to bottom, as you can see here. This also changes a bit how the different flex start and flex end properties work for laying out your different elements. Let's say that we wanna just select one random box. We'll just do the, we'll do the second child. So we'll say, and the child of two. I'm gonna change the height here to be half the normal height. So we're gonna say 100 pixels, just like that. And now what we can do is I'm gonna change the width as well, 100 pixels, there we go. So now we have a smaller box right here. And if I change the align items here to flex start, you can see that this is showing up on the very left-hand side of my screen. But if I change my writing mode from the left-right vertical to the right-left, so everything reads from right to left, now the start is on the right side of my container. So when you use flex start and flex end, they actually depend on the writing direction that you're using, for example, our writing mode, as well as the way that you're flowing your things using your flex direction. So if we change our flex direction here to column and we save, you can now see it's actually technically a row in our writing direction because our writing mode is vertical and our flex direction is column. So it's kind of doing a double flip and it's going back to a row based way of doing things. And again, if we change this from left to right, here you can see that our everything is changing. Now our number one is on the right here. While well, we go to this, our number five is on the left here. So it's changing around everything based on our writing direction as well as our flex direction. So with those two properties combined together, you can do a lot of really cool stuff where your content automatically rules around to properly fit the writing mode you're in for the specific language you're targeting. Now let's talk about something else, which is how the align content property works. You're pretty familiar with Flexbox. You probably know that you have the justify content and align items properties that you can set, but you know you can also use align content to change how your content works when you wrap onto multiple lines. Let's just come in here. I'm gonna get rid of all this code. And all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna set a hard coded height to our container here of like 300 pixels. And I'm going to say that we're also going to have a border of like five pixels solid black, just so we can see that. There we go, and let's actually make it a little bit bigger. Let's make it 500 pixels tall. So you can see we have this black container that contains everything. 
And if we wanted to align our content inside of there, we could just say align content, let's say center. And now what it's going to do is it's gonna put our content in the center, but you'll notice it didn't actually move anything. And that's because it'll only move your content when you actually have wrapping going on. So if we change our flex wrap here to wrap, and now if I just make our width a little bit smaller, let's say 100 pixels, not 200, so it does do some wrapping, you can see now everything is centered. Even when everything's on one line, as long as I have wrapping set to be true here, my content is going to be centered. But if we add two lines, for example, by giving us a width of 200 pixels, and let's change our height here to 150, you can see it's in the center. But I could also say I want it to be at this end, so it's gonna be at the end. I could put some space between, and it's going to space them out as much as possible. So if you have a hard-coded height on your flex container, for example, this height of 500 pixels, or it just has a specific height in general, and you have it so that it's wrapping with flex wrap, you can use align content to specify how you want those different rows to be laid out from one another. And again, you cannot use align content unless you have wrapping, because if we have this set to no wrap, you can see it doesn't actually do anything, even if our stuff is wide enough to support wrapping. Now let's move that back to how we had it before. Let's just clear all that out. And inside of here, I'm gonna change my width and my height to 100 pixels each. So it's gonna be a pretty small box. And that's because I wanna talk about the flex property inside of CSS Flexbox. You probably are familiar with flex grow, flex shrink, and flex basis, but there's actually a property called flex just like this that is a shorthand for all three of those. And depending on how many properties you specify, it tries to very smartly fill in what the different values should be. So before we talk about this flex property, we first need to understand what are the defaults for a normal flexbox item. When you create a flexbox container with this dot flex and you put things inside of it, everything by default is going to have a flex shrink set to one. It's going to have a flex grow set to zero, and it's going to have a flex basis here, which is the third property that is going to be set to auto. And if we save, you can see nothing has changed because these are the default values. And essentially what this is saying is it's saying, okay, the flex basis is like how wide something should be in the flex box world. So it's saying just use the normal width. Our flex grow is saying don't grow and flex shrink says shrink down to be as small as you can be to fit within the container. So if we change our width here to like 500 pixels, you'll notice it still shrinks all of our boxes down to less than 500 pixels so they all fit within the row. So that is what flex shrink is doing. If we had flex shrink set to zero, you can see everything is 500 pixels and it's not shrinking down to fit within the container. And these defaults make a lot of sense. But what happens if you wanna change them around? Let's change our width back to 100 pixels here and let's select only our nth child, which will be number two again. And instead I'm gonna use that flex property. I'm just gonna pass in the value of one. When I do this, you'll notice our box number two has grown to take up all the remaining space. And that's because when you set a flex of one, it changes your flex grow to be one. So it's a flex grow of one. It changes your flex shrink to actually be zero. And our flex basis actually gets changed to zero as well. So it's essentially just saying only allow this box to grow. Do not let it shrink and grow as if it started out at a size of zero. So just take up all the space possible. Next, if we pass a second value here, for example, I pass in the value of one. Well, this is going to pass a value for flex grow and flex shrink. So both grow and shrink are going to be set to one. If I change this to two, then my shrink would be set to two. So we just change this back to one and that's going to give us properties like this. And we don't have any shrinking going on because this needs to grow to fill all the remaining space. Now, if we passed in a third value, for example, I said 50 pixels. Now that is going to set my flex basis right here. And this would be the equivalent long form of that. And if I save, you can see again, it's not making much difference. And that's because our basis here is not making any changes to how our actual code will lay itself out. Now we've talked quite a bit about flex basis in this tip here, and that actually leads into the next advanced concept, which is the whole idea of how flex basis works, because it's a quite confusing topic unless you truly understand Flexbox. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of all this code here. And up here, I'm just going to change my flex grow to be one. So all of my elements are going to grow to fill up as much space as possible. I'll remove that flex basis. And for now you can see all of our elements are the exact same width as each other. If I come in here with a flex basis though, and let's just say I change element two to have a flex basis of like 200 pixels. I save, you can now see element two is a little bit bigger. And if I examine this, we can actually check the exact size. And you can see that when I hover over this element, it says it is 213 pixels, while all of our other elements are 113 pixels. And you'll notice something really interesting. We take the width of our normal box, it's 100 pixels. And since our flex basis by default is set to auto, that just means that our flex basis is essentially the exact same as our width. So 100 pixel width with an auto flex basis means our flex basis is 100 pixels. 
So our bases for our boxes are 100 pixels, but our second box has a base of 200 pixels. So that means what we do is we take all those different elements, if we remove the flex square real quick, is what it's going to do is it's going to lay out those elements without changing around any of the spacing. And then what it's going to do, since all of these elements are growing, is it's going to take all the space that's left inside of our container, and it's going to evenly divide that up between all of our boxes, because they all have the same flex grow property. So since there's 13 times 5 extra pixels available, we're going to put 13 extra pixels of space on each element. But it starts from the flex basis. So this one grows from 200 to 213, while all these other boxes have a 100 pixel basis, so they grow from 100 to 113. This is actually a really common problem a lot of people run into because if your boxes are different sizes and you do a flex grow of one, you may think they should all end up being the exact same size, but because they start out at different flex bases, that is going to cause you problems because they won't actually be the exact same size. So if you want all your elements to be the same size, you just need to set a flex basis of zero. That's going to start them out as if their size was zero, and now they're going to always grow to be the exact same size. No matter how much content is in all the boxes, they will all be the exact same size. Now, if we come down here to our flex basis again, we could change this here, for example, to zero to see what happens. And you can see now this box number two is much smaller. If we inspect it here, you can see this box two is 50 pixels while all their other boxes here are 153. So we had 53 pixels of extra space per box left. So each box got given 53 pixels, but this box number two started at zero. And that is why it is only 53 pixels while all the other boxes are 153 pixels. Now, if we do come in here and let's say we set a flex basis of 50 pixels on all these boxes, we have a width defined, but we also have a flex basis. Well, essentially the width is going to be completely ignored in this regard. And our flex basis is going to overtake that for flex box purposes. So our boxes are all going to start at 50 pixels of space, and it's going to add all the additional space into them. Another thing interesting about flex basis is it does the same exact thing for shrinking. So let's say if by default, our flex basis for our boxes was set to 500 pixels, and we just changed here, nothing. So our flex shrink should be zero or should be one. Now, if we save, you can see it's going to shrink down all of our different boxes. And let's set this one to like 100, just so we can see what we're talking about. If we examine our page, we click inspect here, and we look at this element, you can see this box is 155 pixels. This box right here is 46 pixels, and all the other boxes are 155 pixels. So they aren't actually the 500 pixels of total space. What happens is it lays out all the boxes and it says, okay, we have 500 plus 500 plus 100 plus 500 plus 500. That's way larger than our normal container. So we need to remove space from them. Since all of our boxes by default have a shrink of one, it's going to remove the same amount of space from each box, starting at our flex basis here. Now you will notice it didn't shrink down our box two nearly as much as boxes one, three, four, and five. And that's just because Flexbox is smart enough to know that if we removed like 300 pixels of space from box two, well, it would be negative 200 pixels wide, which doesn't make sense. So it's smart enough to know to not like completely collapse elements if it doesn't have to. It'll try to take away extra space from the big elements and keep the small elements at least big enough to fit all of their content inside of them. For example, just this number two here. Now that was a lot of complicated talk on flex basis, and that's because this is really one of the more confusing topics of Flexbox. But now I wanna talk about the final tip, which is a really easy one, which you've probably seen before, and that is how auto margins work in Flexbox. I'm just gonna get rid of this all here. So now we have essentially five boxes, but they don't fill up the full size of our container. Well, if we take box two, and I say margin on the left is auto, all that's going to do is it's going to take all the extra space and it's gonna put it on the end of box number two. It's just taking all that space, moving it to the left of box two. If I put the margin on the right to be auto as well, now it's going to split the remaining space in between the two sides of box two. I could do the same thing for box number three, for example, and I could say, you know what, the margin on the right of this one is gonna be auto. So now it takes all the remaining space, divides it by three, and puts it in each one of those margin areas, just like that. This is a really cool way to do the space out element. For example, one of the most common things you wanna do is let's say the last element, we want to space out further. So we can just come in here, I'll even write this as last child. And I could just say the margin on the left is auto. So now the last element is going to be separated from all of the other elements. I can do the same thing with the first child. So I can come in here, say first child, put the margin on the right to be auto. Now you can see that the middle content has been separated from the left and the right side item. This is really nice because it makes it easy to space elements out because sometimes you don't want everything to be evenly spaced. You want large gaps between different sections of content. Margin auto is going to be the easiest way to do that. So how many of them did you end up knowing? Did you know all six? None of them? Let me know down in the description below. 
Also, if you're interested in refreshing your memory on Flexbox or learning about the more advanced CSS grid, I'll have both those videos linked right over here. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.